day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook, and they became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said.
was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rolled to rest. Yeah. When death was arrested and my life began. Today, because of the gift of Jesus Christ, the way he was obedient to death, 
So we come today to honor him. the highest praise, the hallelujah. Oh, yeah. 
for this space, this place where we get to gather your beloved, the sons and daughters, that we get to gather together in this place to feel your Holy Spirit move among us and in us. That we can come close to you, no separation. There is nothing we can do that separates us from the love of God. And so thank you for bringing us together to remember Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and what it has done for us. The freedom that he has bought us. The redemption he has given us. That we may turn and be renewed day by day, morning by morning. Thank you for your glory in our lives, working in us and through us. And thank you for this opportunity to lean in to what you have next for our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There were an Easter. Literally, you've heard from the time that here in the spring when the days were no longer than the nights. But for the person who knows Jesus Christ, Easter means a lot more than that. It means that even though Jesus died, salvation didn't. Even though Jesus was buried, hope wasn't. Because Jesus is alive. Easter means there is forgiveness for my failures, grace for my guilt, and mercy for my misery. Easter means that the pain and the silence of living in a Saturday world isn't purposeless and it isn't permanent. Easter means that I can't out the grace of God and I can't outrun the reach of God. It means that Jesus is King, light overcomes darkness, and justice will win, and brokenness will be broken. Easter means that the scars on the hands of Jesus are telling a story of victory, not defeat. And the same is true for me. It means that I am not alone, not ashamed, not forgotten, and not forsaken. It means that the rain and the storms and the wind and the waves of this world will not have the last word because my future is a resurrected body with a resurrected Jesus on a resurrected earth. Easter means that I can join with a choir of saints and angels singing, Oh death, where is your victory? Oh grave, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your song? Easter means that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for me. Easter means that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you are with me. Hey, good morning. I have two thoughts this morning. The first is kind of a, it's a God thought, and the second is a Mike thought, okay? Which one do you want first? The God thought, I knew that. Um, I know it's not really like an Easter passage, but something came to my mind while I was standing back there singing, and you sing really good, by the way. So don't let anybody tell you that your voice is a shower-only voice. It really is a good voice. Um, you know that verse? It, it's in the book of Romans where it says, um, since God is for us, who could be against us? Are, are you familiar with that verse in the Bible at all? You've heard that before? Yeah. Um, you know, if there's one thing that I would pull out of Easter, it would be that, um, wow, God really is for us. And I've told you before, if, if you're here, you know, kind of part of the fellowship family, um, you can tell a lot about verses in the Bible by the, the prepositions that are used. Like when the Bible says God is for us, the word for is literally a preposition. It's only got three letters to it, but it means all the world to us, right? Because that's God saying, I am for you, I'm not against you. And I know a lot of people in this world, honestly, who would say that when they think of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the all-powerful God, they would say that this is how God feels about me. Something like that. Like, um, you just keep your distance right now. This is as close as you can get. Or maybe you shouldn't be here at all. Instead, our God is not the this God. Our God is the this God. Because our God is for us, not against us. So when you think about Easter and empty tombs and crosses with white cloths on them and all this kind of stuff, stuff that's just God's way of saying, I'm still for you. And if you get nothing else out of this morning, my hope is that when you walk out of here in a while, 
um, he would walk out saying, I, I think I, I just heard today that God is for me and God is not against me. Regardless of who you are, regardless of where you came from, regardless of whether this past week was a good week or a not so good week, God is still for you. That's the God thought. You want to hear the Mike thought? Man, I sure hope the fire marshal is not in this room right now. That was just kind of my, if he is, I hope he's blind or something like that. Or, so. um, friends, uh, we're really glad that you're here this morning and glad that you're here for worshiping this morning. Uh, in a while, when the service is finished, you, you can head on uh, through those double doors there. And we've got a lot of great refreshments today. They're kind of in the hallway and off into Fellowship Hall. You can follow the hungry crowd. We are so glad you're here today. If you're one of our guests this morning, you can stop by that information desk in the back. And uh, there are some folks there who'd love to just greet you and, and pass out a, 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 a welcome bag to you. Um, just a, a little advance notice at Fellowship here in a couple of weeks, two weeks from today, we're starting a new series, and it's a series on grief. Yeah, don't look at me that way. You're thinking, geez, after Easter, are you kidding me? Well, here's what I know. It's that um, as we all come through this pandemic thing and everything else that's going on in the world, and it just seems like um, I know a lot of people right now who are dealing with loss and grief and the shoulda, woulda, couldas and the has-beens and all that kind of stuff. I think God, through the resurrection, God wants to say to us something about grief in this world and loss in this world and pain in this world. So I sure hope you'll come back in a couple of weeks and, um, and uh, we're going to spend a number of weeks just talking about how it is that God wants us to deal with loss and pain in this life. Because God has something to say to us on our best days, right? And then God has something to say to us on our best days, right? And then God has something to say to us on our not-so-best days. And here's what I hope you know. God has something to say to you on your worst days, too. Will you pray with me, please? Um, God, it's so good to be here with you this morning and to be able to celebrate what you have done. You went so far above and beyond what any of us would have ever dared to dream that you would do. For any one of us, oh God, we, we'd be okay with you just being the creator of the world who's kind of okay with us being alive and that maybe, just maybe, there'd be something good for us after we die. Instead, oh God, your word tells us that no ear has heard, no mind, no eye has seen, and no mind has conceived what you've what you'd prepared for those who love you. You allowed Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us to save us from our sins and then you raised him to everlasting life, to open the doors and show us what our life with you will be like as well. We are so grateful to you. Kind of running out of words. So grateful to you for your willingness to accept these hearts in any condition we bring them. And that your arms are always open, you're always welcoming in, you always have something just good to share with us. So God, we're thankful for today. And we pray, God, that um, Easter would be far more than just... Um, a nice day with some really cool flowers and dinner with the family and maybe a nice worship service. God, we, we don't want worship to be a day or an event. We want Easter, oh God, to be a lifestyle so that when we leave here, we're carrying some new reality, some new thought in our heart about you and may it condition the way that we live this coming week, that we are people of hope and people who believe that you are active in this world and people who believe that our God is not against us our god is for us that you are the god who walks with us through the best times in life and the not so best times in life we just celebrate you today and god we pray that every church in town would be having a great day today every church help them to have a wonderful day today we pray that many people would be gathered in places oh god and just celebrating you we pray oh god that for for families for whom this is um maybe a difficult day because in a while they're they're going to have family dinner, brunch, lunch, maybe a little something tonight. And there's going to be an empty chair there. And that hurts. Father, there are grieving people in this place, and there are grieving people in our community. Father, through what Jesus has done, may grief feel different. Because you've unlocked the doors of heaven. <laughs> you've thrown them wide open to us. And you've extended your arms of grace and mercy to us as well. And we know that someday, because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, someday there will be an incredible family reunion and we'll all celebrate you all the more. God, thanks for loving all of us more than any of us will ever know. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this body of Christ. And thanks for gathering us today. 
And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're going to read a scripture passage together today. It comes from one of the books in the Bible called John. John is one of the Gospels. There's actually four Gospels in your Bible, four stories of Jesus. And this is John's Gospel. It's John 21. You can follow along if you like in your Bibles, or you can just listen as I read it. I was going to say something like, um, this is one of my favorite passages, but then you'd probably say, you say that every week or something like that. So I just won't even say that. It begins like this. Afterward, so this is after Jesus' death and the resurrection. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the same as the Sea of Galilee. You've probably heard that name before. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, his name is John, by the way, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. We'll talk about that some other day. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. That sounds a little repetitive. We'll talk about why in a couple of minutes. Friends, these are our Bibles. This is God's word which has been given to us and gifted to us, as always. May God's word be alive in this place and in every heart today as well. Amen. Let me ask you a question. And I, I'm not asking you to respond out loud, but you can just respond in your heart. Have you ever let anyone down in this world? Have you ever disappointed anybody? Have you ever not met expectations? And we're not talking about on the job because we all do it on the job. Have you ever failed? Have you ever set out to do something and other people saw that you were going to do it and maybe they were kind of cheering you on from the sidelines and then at some point in time it just didn't work out and maybe something went wrong, whatever it was, and, 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 and you failed? Okay, let's try this. Have you ever looked in the mirror and thought to yourself, man, what a failure. Have you ever looked in the mirror and just recognizing the things that haven't gone so right in your life. And looked at that face staring back at you and thought, man, what a failure. What a colossal failure. There are people in the Bible story who know exactly what you felt like. So let me back up just a minute and share a few things with you. We jumped over some of the resurrection stories. You probably remember those stories from other times that you've heard them, that Jesus dying on the cross, choosing the nails, even though choosing the nails would have been incredibly painful to him. He chose the nails so that he could choose you as well. Jesus dies on the cross. This terrible trial that took place, if you want to call it that, executed. When he was standing by the fire that night, all of Jesus' disciples were there, and one by one, they all abandoned him as well. So he died alone. And then there was the tomb, and the tomb was empty, 
And the disciples were probably confused and surprised and wanting to believe, but not sure if they could dare to believe and all those kinds of things. And, and then there was a day when the disciples were all together inside of a room, and the Bible tells you the door was locked because they were scared. And inside that room, Jesus just appeared. Didn't even bother to use the door or anything. He just appeared to show them that he was alive. He just stuck around for a short period of time and then disappeared again. And the disciples were left with, well, okay, so we all failed him. We all denied him. We had this incredible opportunity to follow him. And we all set out with the best of intentions. Hey, we're going to give our life to this guy because we just believe him. And then they got to the end of the journey and they... They all failed. They all left. They all ran. And then Jesus shows up in that room to show them that he's still alive and and they get to celebrate, but it kind of feels like, um, how do you celebrate when you never bothered to show up for the game in the first place? It kind of feels like attending the victory parade for somebody else, right? And so after Jesus left that room, the disciples all must have thought to himself, well, what do we do now? I mean, now what do we do? So they all went back to what they did best, at least what they did before Jesus came along. They went back to fishing. Simon Peter was a fisherman. His brother Andrew was a fisherman. James and John, those guys were fishermen. They all fished for a living. So after this is all done, they end up back up on the Sea of Galilee. They put out on a boat late at night because that's when they would go fishing, and they fished. How many of you like to fish for fun or whatever and have come home with the dreaded empty bucket. Absolutely. We just call that drowning worms, right? What you doing? Just drowning some worms or something like that, right? So those guys who fished for a living, they fished all night, and they got the empty bucket. The stringer's empty, and they're thinking to themselves, man, I can't even fish right anymore. I gave this up so I could follow him. Failed at that. Came back here to do this again, got to eat, and I can't even do this right anymore. And all of a sudden, somebody looks up and they, they see a guy on the beach. I mean, it, it's like 100 yards away, so they can't see who it is. But they see somebody on the beach, and he's hollering out to them. What did he say? I don't, you, you listen. Hey, guys, got any fish? <laughs> what did you think about it? Jesus knew they didn't have any fish, so what does he ask them? Hey, guys, how's the fishing out there? Or something like that. You know what we call that? Let's rub it in a little bit. Why not? You guys can't even fish right anymore, right? And then he says something to him like, um, say, have you tried throwing that net on the other side of the boat? I'm just absolutely positive that all the disciples in that boat at the same time did, I never thought of that, or something like that, right? Like, no, it never occurred to me to try to fish off the other side of the boat. Of course they did. So they put the net in the water, and they can't even pull the net back into the boat because there's so many fish in the, bo- in the net. And they're all of a sudden struck with the idea that something just happened here, like the kinds of things that we saw happen when we actually were following Jesus for three years. They look up, they recognize him on the beach and say, it's him again. So some of them start towing the net along, Peter, because he's kind of the impulsive type and doesn't always make the best of decisions. He just jumps in the water and starts swimming as if he can swim faster than the guys in the boat can pull it along. And when they all get to the shore, they find this fire built there, just like the fire that Jesus was standing at when they abandoned him. Don't think they didn't remember that when they walked up on that beach. And so they crawl up on that beach, pull the boat up there, trying to pull all the fish in as well, and there's Jesus standing by that fire. And he says, come on, bring, bring some more of that fish in here. We're, we're going to have fish barbecue for breakfast. That sounds delicious right about now, doesn't it? No. But they had barbecued fish for breakfast. And there was some bread there as well. And knowing what they did, what Jesus could have said is, help yourself. Just help yourself. I, I, I prepared breakfast for you there, but you... Just help yourself and eat as much as you want, and I'll let you have free breakfast on me today. That's not what the story says. It says that he served them. Go back and read it. It says that when they came up on the shore, it says that he served them breakfast. He literally gave them the bread and gave them the fish, and he didn't pinch them when he gave it to them. He could have. He could have said, hey, remember me, or something like that. But instead... He just served him breakfast. I don't know about you, 
But if I think back to the times in my life when people have disappointed me or not met expectations or flat out failed me, I don't know that I'm really in the mood to cook them breakfast. You know what I mean? I can think of other things I would probably do instead. But I think it's an incredible display of where Jesus' heart is. Because about the time that these guys, who failed him as bad as anybody failed him, about the time they come straggling up on this beach with the fish that he helped them catch, his response is, um, you have a seat, guys. I fixed you breakfast. And I'm going to serve you too. Here's what they were probably expecting. When Jesus was on that beach, they thought for sure that when they got up on the beach, there'd be a podium and a series of chairs. Kind of like, oh, I don't know, kind of like what you're sitting in right now. A number of chairs like this, and they would all sit in the chairs, and Jesus would say, okay, boys, let's go through this again. Little theology lesson. Let me remind you of some things that God is doing through me, and we're going to start back at the beginning since you all forgot. That's not what he did. No theology lessons, no doctrinal discussions, just something like, um, man, you guys look hungry. You've been fishing all night, haven't you? They know it, and he knows it. They know it. It's like this elephant in the room thing where, like, he's going to hit us any minute with this. Jesus, we failed you. But instead, his response is, you guys hungry? I made you breakfast. I got the plates all out. I can tell that you're hungry. Let me feed you. I want to give you a couple of words today that I think maybe will help you understand how the disciples could have felt back then. Here's those words. Guilt. Guilt is an emotion that you've all felt at some point in time in this life. Guilt is an emotion you feel. It's an emotion of regret or remorse at having done something wrong or perhaps just not having done the right thing. You all feel guilty at some point in time when you're kind of left with the, oh, I should have done this instead or I shouldn't have done that. Guilt is an entirely natural emotion and psychologists would say it's not a bad emotion because guilt can be an incredibly powerful motivator. When you feel guilty over something that didn't go so well, guilt motivates you to better behaviors in the future. Guilt's not bad. They probably all felt that on that beach that day. Here's where it goes wrong. Sometimes guilt turns into shame. And at some point in time, some of you have probably felt shame. Shame is what happens when people like me can't let, can't let go of guilt. Guilt is simply an emotion that arises from something in our past for which we'd say, boy, I'm really not pleased by that. But guilt can be that motivator towards behaviors in the future. Shame is what happens when you start identifying yourself with the thing you did wrong. Guilt is just the, wow, I should do better next time. Shame is the, I could never do better next time. Shame is an identifier. And you can't let go of shame very quickly. Here's what I think of when I think of shame. Somebody's got their finger on the rewind button for life's remote control and they just keep playing it again and again and again as though to say, that thing in my life that I'm not proud of, that thing that kind of haunts me, that's who I am. And you just keep playing it again and again and again. Here's what I know about people, because I've spent a lot of time with people over the years. When you find somebody who can't get their finger off the rewind button on life's remote control, at some point in time, they give up hope for the future. Really. Because the shame just becomes part of their life and they begin to think of, that's who I am. That thing that I did or that thing that I didn't do, that's who I am. Now, I don't know where the disciples were. I don't know what their heart sets were. I know the guilt was pretty heavy and I don't doubt for a second that there was shame there. Where at least a few of them were thinking to themselves, man, I'll never get back to where I was. I had this chance in my life standing by my fishing boat on the Sea of Galilee three years ago, and Jesus walked past and said, I choose you. Yeah, yeah, you, the short one. I'll take you for my gang. We're going to go change the world together. And we had this chance to go do something powerful, and then, and then we just failed. I don't know what happened, but we just failed. And I'll bet some of those disciples sitting on that beach that day are thinking to themselves, I'll never have another chance like that again as long as I live because I had my chance and blew it. And I'll bet there's at least one person in this room right now who's thinking to themselves, I had my chance. At whatever it was in life, I had my chance and I blew it. And I can't do anything right. I remember years ago, a young gentleman who was sitting in my office 
in another church. And he was saying to me, um, yeah, Mike, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that maybe other people would be better off if I wasn't around. And then he used some other language that just, oh, tear my heart out. And I would say, well, why, why would you think that way? I mean, tell me what you're thinking. He said, because I can't do anything right. I can't do anything right anymore. You know what that is? Shame. That's just shame. That's just saying, I'm a royal screw-up, and I can't do anything right anymore. That's way past guilt. That's guilt on steroids. That's saying, this is who I am now. That's shame. Let me tell you what an empty tomb does. An empty tomb says, no more shame. An empty tomb says, you will always feel guilt in this life when things take place in your life for which you'd say, well, I wish I hadn't done that, or I wish I'd done that better. That's guilt. Guilt can be a powerful motivator. Shame says, that's who you are, and God says, that is not who you are. So here's what happens next. Jesus pulls aside Simon and says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Anybody here have a mom who, when you were little, would use your last name or your middle name when she wanted to get your attention? <laughs> Absolutely. My name is Mike. Some people call me Michael. You don't. But my mother, every now and then, would call me Michael William. That's usually when we kind of slink underneath the coffee table or something like that, right? Michael William. Peter had nicknames. More often than not, Jesus just called him Peter. But when he wanted to get his attention, it was something like Simon, son of John. Now that I have your undivided attention. Simon, I want to know if you love me more than anything in the world. See, when breakfast was done, Jesus is like, hey, Peter, let, let's, let's take a walk here. And Peter's thinking, he's, he's going to rub my nose in this for sure. And Jesus' response is, no, I, I just want to know if you love me more than anything. I, I know people have debated the, then these things over the years, but I think what John, Jesus was saying is just, Peter, I just want to know if you love me. No theology lesson, no profession of faith, no, we're going to start back at the beginning and hear your commitment to me all over again, just the... I want to know if you love me. And Jesus asks him the same question three times over. Like, do you love me? Go feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my lambs. By the third time, Peter's like, are you not hearing me? I think the reason why Jesus asked him three times is because if you remember back to the crucifixion stories, when Peter denied Jesus three times, denied even knowing them, Jesus then comes back and says, okay, I was there. I saw the whole thing. Do you love me? And I'm going to ask that question three times. Because three times I heard you say, I don't know who he is. So this is your chance to start over again, buddy. I just want to know that you love me. If you've ever been in a place in life, and maybe that place is right now, where you've thought, you know, I think Jesus gave me a life, but when I look at the list of things that I've done wrong, or the list of things in which I have lived in such a way that I didn't even know who he was, he'll never take me back. When things like that happen in this life, Jesus doesn't come and say, oh, oh you got it all wrong. We're going to go back to the beginning with a theology lesson. Instead, he just says, do you, do you still love me? Because love changes people's lives. Commitments to doctrine don't change anybody's lives. But when Jesus says, I just need to know that you still love me. Because if you love me, we're going to go right back at it again here. And here's what Jesus could have said. He could have said, um, Simon Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Okay, you can be one of the disciples again, but now you're at the back of the line. Here's your broom. That's the best we can do for you, or something like that. Instead, Jesus says something like this, go lead my church. I know he said something about feeding sheep, but he didn't really mean physical sheep. He literally meant, Peter, I want you to go back to the church, and you are going to lead my people by feeding them from my word. You're going to go back to a leadership position, Peter. I know you wouldn't dare to dream of that. Because, buddy, when you came up out of the water a few minutes ago, you had that look of guilt on your face that said to me, you don't think you belong here anymore. But, Peter, I want you to know, you're exactly the kind of person I'm looking for for leading the church. Because Jesus Christ loves to take people who have fallen down on their knees guilt, maybe even shame, pick them up, dust them off, and not just put them at the back of the line and give them a broom and say, you can still hang around the others, but you'll never lead again. Instead, he says, people who, I get, people who get restored and they understand forgiveness, front of the line. It's exactly the kind of people I want leading the church. And when Peter went back to lead, and boy, did he ever lead. 
because now we got it. Because now we really felt like, hey, I've been restored. I've been given another chance at this. I have life again. If you're at a place in your life where maybe you still feel some guilt over some things, or maybe there's some sense of shame deep inside of you, I want you to know that from, the, from the Jesus dying on the cross and through the empty tomb and even the words that Jesus says standing on the beach that day, he doesn't want you to live with shame or anything like it. He doesn't want you to identify yourself according to the things that you did wrong because if anybody on that beach that day should have said to themselves, I don't deserve this, it would have been Peter. And yet he's the one who's right back at the head of the class because that's what Jesus does with people who fail. He just wants to know if we still love him. And when we say, you betcha I still love you, man. I can't believe you're even talking to me right now. Of course I still love you. Jesus' response says, that's exactly the kind of person I'm looking for. Head of the class with you. You can lead now. I'm going to put a guy like you in charge of my church, Peter. Because I know you've got the right heart for it now. If you or anybody you know is living in the past, pushing that rewind button again and again and again, still living with that guilt and that shame, that's not coming from God. That's coming from our own perception of ourselves. It comes from the devil, all that kind of stuff. Instead, Jesus says, I'd love to pick you up and clean you off and set you on a better path again. I just want to know that you love me. I know how the world deals with people who fail, but I know how Jesus deals with people who fail too. He fixes them breakfast on the beach. Will you pray with me, please? God, thanks for loving all of us more than any of us will ever know. We're so grateful to be your children. and We're so grateful that your arms are still open and you're still accepting and you're still loving. And Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning who's still living with a sense of shame over some things that have taken place in the past, just serve them breakfast on the beach instead. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. Yes, that is the enthusiasm. Let us stand up, he is risen.
As cruel as a grave, and shame is a robber, yet he's come to take my name. When love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground, and love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear that. And love is a trumpet sound And love is my weapon I'm gonna take my giants down There ain't no Trumpet sound. I'm gonna rise 
God who says, I, I didn't create you to be in that position. Some spiritual grave, emotional grave. Our God is a God who says, no shame. I break those ties. I break that bond that that identity has upon you. I want to know that you love me again. And I love to restore people. Our God is always a restorer. And if you're in need of being restored, just know that his arms are fully open for you. Friends, if you'd like to pray with anybody today before you leave, there are some folks who will gather right up front. They'd love to pray over you. 
Just a reminder, there are some really cool refreshments. Everybody say one, two, three, Rikes. One, two, three. Rikes, hallelujah. Down the hall and in Fellowship Hall as well, there's plenty of snacks here, and I sampled them. They're good, so just want to make sure you knew I was taking care of that for you. Um, thank you, Larry. Um, um, we're just grateful to have you here today. And as you leave this place, we want to give you this gift as well. May the Lord your God go with you. May the Lord your God watch over you. May the Lord your God live within you. And may he give you the same power and love that pulled Jesus up out of that grave. You have been restored. Go in peace, friends. Amen.